the May 2021 edition of City Connection. And again, City Connection is the live program with Grand Rapids Mayor Rosalind Bliss in partnership with Grand Rapids Community Media Center. And this is when we offer the community the opportunity to hear about efforts from City Hall and beyond with Community Media Center. I'm your host, Linda Galash. And we do have in studio now, in person, not by video anymore, uh, Rosalind Bliss, Mayor of Grand Rapids. Today, we also welcome to the studio a little bit later in the program, Jordan Eatman. He is a neighborhood coordinator with the Office of Equity and Engagement. So the Grand Rapids Neighborhood Summit is coming up, scheduled for the first week of June, and it has the theme of moving beyond diversity. And we're gonna learn quite a bit about that when we have Jordan here in the studio with us. Just want to let you know that we have towards the end of the show opportunity for your questions and comments with the mayor and we'll do that live that's where you can take part in the conversation by uh, email you can do it at cityconnection at grcmc.org also through twitter twitter is at grtv access or by commenting at the grtv facebook page again community uh, city connection is a collaboration between community media center and the city of grand rapids broadcasting live right now on channel 24 cable channel 24 streaming live at the rapidian.org as well as at grtv's facebook page we'll rebroadcast throughout the month and that'll be on cable channel 25 grtv so with all of that i want to say welcome to mayor bliss it's uh, feeling a little bit like the seasons have changed we're in may now yeah it's gone by so fast i feel like April was a, a little bit of a blur to me. It was so busy. Uh, so yeah, it's good to be good to be here in May and spring. And so with spring and with some of these uh, nicer weathers, you had um, an event that had to do with planting trees, a greening initiative. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So we, I was out uh, planting trees this weekend over in Plaster Creek Park. Um, so if you're familiar with that park, it's a park that we redeveloped a couple years ago, and it's one of my favorite. Uh, park developments because we worked with the students uh, there at Burton Elementary to help design that park and it's a natural playground so we used all uh, wood that we had at our uh, Domtar site uh, from some of the major storms we've had so we reused a lot of the a lot of the wood that comes from streets from all over our city to create that playground uh, but it needed trees, so uh, that we, we planted about 50 trees in the park and then in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, we'll actually be doing some additional tree planting this spring, uh, but we broke up the Mayor's Greening Initiative this year and we're going to do a planting in the spring and a planting in the fall. And hopefully in the fall we'll actually be able to get together in a larger group uh, and, and do the, about 250 trees in, in one day bigger crowds and is that typically in the park or is it curbside or is it uh, yeah you know? so it's usually so this is the fifth year so I started this when I became mayor um, and it's it's uh, not tax payer funded it's money that I raise through private donations and I do it in partnership uh, with friends at Grand Rapids Park so between private donations and sponsorships and um, we recently got a grant uh, all of it is is grant funded and then we use volunteers to come out and join us to plant the trees and what we've done in years past, uh, and it's true again for this year, is that we identify a neighborhood in the city uh, that is lacking trees or lacking green space. So what we're trying to do is identify, okay, where are neighborhoods that, that need more trees and ones that when we measure the urban canopy, they are much lower than the 40%, which is our goal. Uh, and then we work with the neighborhood to identify locations where we can plant trees. And we typically do them in the right of way. Uh, so in, pe in front of people's homes and between the sidewalk and the street, uh, and then in other public spaces. And so uh, sometimes it's parks, uh, but then sometimes it's other places as well. So one year we did around Pl Plaza Roosevelt and Roosevelt Park and in that neighborhood. Um, one year we did it around um, MLK Park. One year we did it over on the west side around Sullivan Field. Uh, so each year we move it around. Okay, so there's a lot of benefit to adding trees, yeah. that green canopy, but also you know purifying of the air and that sort of thing. The city was yeah. recently recognized for this effort of, of uh, something like called Tree City. Yeah, so we've um, we've been named Tree City USA for a number of years, and uh, we're really glad to maintain that title. Uh, and we have been recognized for our efforts. I mean, we have an urban forest plan. We have a uh, pretty robust plan when it comes to planting trees. 
we need to plant tens of thousands of more uh, trees to get to that 40% tree canopy and to replace the trees that we lose every year. Um, so these past couple of years, we've actually lost some beautiful maples throughout the city because their, their lifespan is only about 50 years. So we, we need to continue to plant trees if we're gonna maintain the canopy. But you're right, it's, trees are good for the environment, but they're also good for people's mental health. Uh, you know, we know that when you have trees in your neighborhood, it actually increases your, your, uh, your, the value of your home. So there's lots of benefits to trees. Helps with stormwater runoff and cleaning water before it gets to the river. Uh, so it's an Im important part of being a green and healthy city. Um, obviously, there's lots of things that we care about and that we focus on, but the environment is one of them. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and speaking of the environment, I uh, uh, last week was able to go on a tour of our biodigester. We talked about that last month. Yes, yeah. and it is remarkable. It is, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we can do more tours as, uh, as we kind of come out of COVID, um, but it's a remarkable development and we will be able to take sludge that we have right there at the wastewater treatment facility as well as um, waste from food manufacturers and, and other manufacturers in town and have it go through this pretty extensive process, obviously, um, to create renewable natural gas will, that will then go into the pipes for DTE and, and be used uh, with DTE. And, and that's how we'll help pay for the cost of the, a portion of the cost of the, of the development and the project. But it's really remarkable. I mean, in addition to creating renewable natural gas, we will be um, recovering phosphorus, uh, and which is also an important uh, environmental aspect of an environmental uh, project that we're doing but it's it's remarkable over two miles of pipes it's wow. it's pretty extensive um, uh, until you walk through it I, I mean you can read about it you can see pictures but until you walk through it you really can't fully appreciate the technology that we've added to our wastewater treatment facility Interesting. Yeah. And then any kind of comparison to the energy that takes to go through that biodigester process and then what it's actually doing for the environment? Yeah, so we actually will be reducing our energy at the wastewater treatment facility and eventually, um, potentially, we could take the renewable natural gas and create electricity to actually have on-site uh, electricity generation that would go and uh, be used on site at the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, so it's, it really is an incredible process. I mean, basically what we're doing is instead of running the waste through our typical wastewater treatment facility process to clean it before it's discharged back in the water, we're sending it through another process that actually creates the renew renewable natural gas. So we have to treat it no matter what. Uh, we're just choosing to treat it in a way that turns it into energy. Which is so a net reduction, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. So kind of on that same theme, um, talking a little bit about the Grand River uh, and a new effort to kind of keep park runoff from ma reaching the Grand. And I don't know if, you'd, um, if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, th you know, that's work that we've been doing for a long time is trying to identify ways to prevent runoff into the river as a whole. And, and it's, I would say it's, a, it's an important, um, it's an important work that we've been doing, but I think it's even more important now as we look at the redevelopment of the river and we wanna add these green spaces and trails mm -hmm. and more activation along the river. We need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent runoff into the Grand River. The Grand River 30 years ago uh, wasn't the cleanest river as we all know, and we probably all have heard stories about not eating the fish out of the Grand River. Uh, the river is much cleaner today. In fact, we've had a number of environmental studies done and our water is clean, the bedrock is clean, there's very little pollution. Uh, and that's because we have been so intentional about making sure that we're reducing runoff and, and reducing waste going into the river. Uh, so m many people don't realize this uh, because it started long before my time, but finished while I was mayor. Uh, but two mayors before me, uh, Mayor Logie, uh, worked with the community and we started to separate our sewer system. Mm -hmm. um, so in our city, we're one of the few cities in Michigan that has a fully separated system and we spent over $300 million to do that. And that reduced our discharge into the Grand River, which I believe was one of the primary reasons why we have a much cleaner river today than we did 30 years ago. 
Absolutely amazing. And now we're yeah. in this process for the river restoration. Yeah. And most recently, uh, a little bit of news on that project is that the number of uh, minority and women-owned businesses that have been able to maybe become contractors for the project. Yeah. Yeah, this has been an important effort, um, not just on the river restoration projects, but at the city. We've been very, very deliberate and intentional about increasing the number of micro LBEs, what we call them, uh, local businesses, uh, minority and women-owned businesses mm -hmm. who are approved vendors with the city uh, so we're trying to increase our spending through procurement to local businesses uh, and so with the river restoration project we know we have a couple years before we're going to start that construction so we're still in the permit process we know what though that construction is going to consist of we know um, you know the kind of subcontractors we're going to need to do that work uh, so we have an incredible uh, person at the city Sierra Atkins who's been working really hard to do intentional work to identify who in our community uh, can potentially bid on those projects I mean it's a 45 million dollar project, and we want those dollars to stay in our community and to support our locally owned businesses especially minority and women owned businesses mm -hmm. So we have uh, done a lot of work, even at the city, if you look at our approved um, MLBE list, uh, it has doubled in the last year. So we're really proud of that work. We have more work to do. It, you know, it's something that we'll continue to do, uh, but we really want to make sure that we're spending any dollar that we can supporting local businesses. Okay. Yeah, that's it's so exciting. Uh, slightly, I'm a little bit familiar with Sierra and some of her work, so that's yeah. that's great to hear. Um, another thing, shifting gears just a little bit, but um, I saw that there's opportunity for uh, summer youth employment and program uh, application period is going a little bit longer for that opportunity. Yes, so this is part of our Grow 1000 program that we started last year. And uh, our hope is to have 650 young people between 16 and 24 match to meaningful work opportunities, uh, part-time jobs this summer uh, in companies across our city. And I'm so grateful for all the companies that have stepped up. And uh, what we found is that we have more slots available than we have uh, applicants right now. So we extended the application process. And how that program works is um, anyone who applies, we they actually go through a training process at the city, uh, similar to our LEAD program. So we go through kind of nuts and bolts of working and soft skills and we bring in speakers and um, prepare young people for these jobs. Mm -hmm. And then we find out what they're interested in and then we'll match them up with those openings at um, different companies throughout the city. Um, so we have some great companies. Spectrum has agreed to uh, hire 100 young people. Wow. ADAC has agreed, Meyer. So we have some incredible opportunities. At the city, we hire um, young people through the Grow 1000 program in many of our departments, um, including parks. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity. And again, we wanna, we wanna provide good paying jobs, summer employment, but also uh, start to connect young people with potential opportunities for jobs in the future. What kind of feedback have you gotten from past uh, participants yeah. and just the, the career boost that that's given them? Yeah, we did, a, we did a report after last summer and the feedback was incredibly positive. Uh, you know, one thing we do want to improve and we always are looking at ways to improve is how do we make sure that those young people have the support that they need. Um, some of them are walking into law firms or um, CPA firms and they're not familiar with the setting and they don't you know they're just it's just a totally new experience for them and they may not know somebody in that setting that they're comfortable asking questions to so we want to make sure that they have support and they have somebody that they can reach out to if they have any questions or if they need help with anything so that area we're still um, working to improve knowing that some young people are going to need just a little you know just somebody to call if they have issues I mean I remember my first job, you know, it was at Taco Bell and even <laughs> I had questions at Taco Bell and, you know, having somebody that you know that you can ask questions to, I think, is an important way to support young people. Mm -hmm. Sonic drive-in for me. <laughs> See? <laughs> Not Valuable on roller skates. experience. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, I think we're ready to take our first <laughs> break, and when we come back, uh, you'll spend a little bit of time with Jordan Eatman and learn a little bit, uh, at least we'll all learn a little bit more yeah. about Neighborhood Summit this year, a little bit different. So we'll be right back after this break here on City Connection.
For over 30 years after humble beginnings as a public access TV station, the Community Media Center has grown to be an active, multi-platform media and technology assistance organization, encouraging and enabling our community to push the creative boundaries. We power a variety of resources, including a music-centered community radio station, WYCE, a community venue with stage and screen at Wealthy Theater, citizen-driven journalism with the Rapidian, a web development team empowering local nonprofits, an education department that trains and broadens students' minds, and a free speech public access television studio, GRTV, where it all began. By introducing audiences to new voices and ideas, we enhance community engagement and create connections between artists and audiences, enriching our city's cultural offerings. We empower and collaborate with platforms and resources accessible to all and used by all. Every free democratic society depends on media, accessible to the community and uncensored by government. The Community Media Center continues this work for the media landscape of today and tomorrow. These platforms and services empower our neighbors to tell their stories and explore the richness of culture that Grand Rapids has to offer. Connect, discover, learn, create, and share the Grand Rapids Community Media Center. All right, glad to have with us today, Jordan, uh, who's been with the city. How long have you been with us now? Since 2016. Oh, wow. I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, and uh, you've, you've uh, had a number of different roles and responsibilities, yes. but your primary one now is the work to help organize and facilitate our annual neighborhood summit. Yes. Uh, and then also um, you do some work in supporting the neighborhood match fund. Correct. And uh, so you can talk more about about your work. Why don't we, why don't we start there? So okay. For folks who don't know you, uh, <laughs> why don't you talk a little bit about your history? You have a long, rich history here in Grand Rapids. Yes, I would love to do that. Um, well, it, it really started with um, when I was actually um, a member of the Mayor's Youth Council. Um, that was big for me and that was something I was voluntold to do with my parents parents and I'm really excited that they actually pushed me to do that um, I will say it had um, really made a huge impact in my life for that um, from there um, of course went to college came back um, it was was really excited to work for the city um, came in as a housing analyst um, so I did a lot of research back in 2016 around our high housing market um, especially when we were at the more height of the housing crisis there and supporting the then um, city manager Sundstrom um, from there, I also um, gravitated towards doing more of support for the neighborhood associations as a whole. And so I meet with them um, and do capacity building with residents um, and also helping to establish um, new neighborhood associations or defunct um, re resident um, leaderships. Um, and then I also do um, NLA, which is called Neighborhood Leadership Academy. Um, we do that um, to give training to resident leaders. Um, and then I also do um, Neighborhood Summit, um, which so I have my mini hats, as you have mentioned. And, and you're active with um, NF. BPA. Oh, yes, yes. So the city, um, especially with our um, the aggressiveness and the positive aggressiveness of our, our city manager, um, saw the importance of um, employee resource groups. Um, and one of those that he um, was affiliated and still is affiliated with was the National Forum for Black Public Administrators. And so we chartered in 2019. Um, a chapter here, the West Michigan chapter, uh, which is exciting because we also was picked, the City of Grand Rapids, to host their annual conference, which is called Forum, of March um, of 2022. So we're really excited to do that. The mayor is co-sponsoring that and she is co-hosting that. So we are excited that
because she is doing that, but we're really excited to be able to bring that opportunity to the City of Rapids for sure. Yeah. You, you do great work throughout the city, both Thank internally you. and uh, in our neighborhoods and with communities. So I Thank really you. appreciate you being here today. Appreciate you. And our big thing, Summit. So um, Summit was started at my, let's see, it was the, I think I was, it was my last year as city commissioner, mm -hmm. I think. So I was on a subcommittee uh, to kind of build up and create a yes. neighborhood summit and uh, was on the committee uh, uh, for a couple of years and then really handed it off to, to community members and to um, city staff. And you all have just grown the summit, made it so, so much better than it was the first year. I mean, it was a learning process. Uh, and, it, and it's just a wonderful event every year. It's one of my favorite events. Typically mm -hmm. we do it in March. Um, obviously because of the pandemic we've had to make we've had to pivot like yes, everybody else yes. and make some changes uh, so this year is going to be a little bit different than years past uh, so why don't you tell us what people can expect and maybe what we're going to focus on this year yes. and, and how it's going to be for folks yes of course uh, well one i want to say thank you for setting that tone really for the neighborhood um, summit it would not exist if it was not for you um, so it was huge shoes to fill um, but we were ready for the challenge and we just were thankful for you setting yeah. that president from the Thanks. beginning. So thank you for that. Yes, so the Grampers Neighborhood Summit is typically a one day event and it has been so for the last six years. Um, I did a brave thing and did not want to cancel um, the Grampers Neighborhood Summit due to the aspects of the COVID-19 and the, and the pandemic. Um, we saw across the city, um, especially with the mayor doing some mandates of asking us to stand outside and get some form of socializing, that there was a desire and need to really interact. Um, and I didn't want to cancel that and miss that opportunity across um, for the Grampus community to be able to engage in, in an activity that they actually look forward to. Um, and so to prevent being able to be inside, um, we decided to move it um, to June with, and this is an active, as she stated, a uh, community led group. Um, and this is doing, going to happen June 1st through the June 5th. Um, and what we wanted to do was do something a little different and bring, typically Summit comes down to downtown and we have people come from all over the city to come, but we wanted to make this a little bit more close to home and provide this into their actual park. And so we are actually going to three different parks, one in representing each of the ward. Um, the first, June 1st, will be our opening ceremony where we'll be at Studio Park C. So we are actually capturing the downtown residents um, for a couple of hours with our keynote speaker, which I'll tell you who that is in a second because right. you actually know who she is, a little oh. hint. Um, and from there, from um, the second, third, and fourth, we will actually be in one of each of the parks and awards. So that's going to be um, Jamba Zoo and Ward 1. Um, Ward 2 will be Riverside Park, and Ward 3 will be McKay JC Park. That's intentionally to make sure that we're just hitting all aspects of all types of residents, the downtown residents and the residents that are in traditional type neighborhoods. So we wanted to make sure we did that. Summit this year um, from the, um, w the second through the fourth will actually um, be from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, this is intentional. A little different this year is Kids Summit is a little different. Typically, Kids Summit was an opportunity to drop mm -hmm. off your your um, child or um, the person that you are overseeing and go about and enjoy some of the adult, more curated uh, workshops. Well, this year, we're going to we do more family center based. So there will be no opportunity to really drop off the kids this year, <laughs> but there will be opportunity to do activities with nice. your particular child. Um, so there's curated things for kids to help with the Kids Summit. We are actually doing something a little twist of a paint and sip but for yeah, youth yeah. and the teen they will have an opportunity to do a paint and talk which will be some certified therapists there to really yeah. talk um, as they're painting to really be able to express different things that's going on and really see how this pandemic has um, really impacted yeah. them um, to be able to have that outlet um, what I did not mention which I will back up really quickly and say what our theme is this year because each year we have a theme and this year's theme is moving beyond diversity dot 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 mm -hmm. this was something that the committee did not want to steer away from um looking at the um social justice movement of 2020 um they really wanted to to address this 
um, heads on and really say, you know, beyond the, it's more than a hashtag. It's more than putting someone in a seat to occupy. Um, it's more than tokenized um, individuals. We have to move beyond that. How are we, are we really honoring? Are we really embracing diversity? Is there a place for everyone to have a sense of belonging? Um, and that was something that the committee really wanted to tackle and bring forth coming um, to have the conversation at the forefront in Grand Rapids. Why not here, right? Mm -hmm. we, we know that Grand Rapids is um, geared to be that center of change. Um, it has been a lot of initiatives that you've done to help with that. So we want to foster that and carry that forward as being agents of change and leading these conversation topics. So that's where that is going. Our keynote speaker is actually a Grand Rapidian who moved away and is actually coming back, Tempest Warfield. Oh. Um, so she'll be coming back to speak on that. And so that's yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, you guys are hearing it first. That's actually something that has not been announced yet, but will be on our website this week to talk about oh. that. But we are super excited to hear her talk about that from um, that lens and also the work that she does with on um, direct with homeless outreach yeah, yeah. Um, in the city of Atlanta right now so she's yeah. very active in that as um, she's doing that in her master's in public health so we're really excited That's about great. this year and then the last thing I will say which we're starting first time ever is called Summit Marketplace um, mm -hmm. which is gonna happen on Saturday so uh, in addition to our closing ceremony um, Summit Marketplace every time at the end we give out gifts to the community that they get in a raffle to win a lot of times people don't win um, and then they are wondering where can I pick this yeah. up or I would like to get that. Well, we knew that the COVID impacted quite a different businesses, um, yeah. particularly the minority businesses. And so we really wanted to create a space that they can showcase for free. I know um, charge to them to be able to set up shop for a few hours downtown and to drive traffic towards the great work and the great entrepreneurs that we have in this city. The city is birthing quite a bit of talent yeah. and to yeah. really be able to showcase that uh, we plan on doing that each year moving forward. So this would be the first time that this is happening, but we wanted to make sure that it was some form of a marketplace to really highlight the entrepreneurs that we have in the community here. Oh, that's great. Where is that going to be? That is actually going to be at Studio Park C as well. So the opening and the closing are um, downtown and we are actually closing off of the, sh the street in front. Oh, nice. So Oaks to really open that up with food trucks at all of the parks as well to really make this a really community wide oh, event. Oh, nice. And Pack Elephant will be open. I Correct. Okay. Yes. Oh, that's will be open in Austin. We're super excited about this year. Oh, that's great. Well, we only have a couple more minutes left to this segment, and then we'll we'll get to um, questions uh, after a break. I'm so I'm so happy to hear about the topic. I think that's so critical um, that we continue that important conversation, and then also I think it's very much aligned with some of the conversations. Um, and, and what we heard from the recent kids speak. Yes. Uh, you know, the impact that COVID has had and um, a number of the young people talked about uh, discrimination and racism. Mm. And uh, so I think it's very, it's, it's wonderful that that's a topic. And, and I love the marketplace idea. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited about that. That's wonderful. Anything final to add before we take a break? Um, yeah, we are going to, so just so everyone knows, we are still practicing guidelines that's provided by CDC. So we are asking everyone to come out um, to wear a mask that will be expected. Um, that is mandatory due to our risk management. We did have a consulting with them. So masks are going to be required. Um, and we're asking you to come out. There's no pre-registration required. We will actually have you sign up when you get there. Um, but yes, it's open to the entire family. And the website is up with yes. the information. What, remind me what that is. Yes, so if you go to the city website um, and you type in the search um, option summit, it's great. You can go directly there for a link, but it is the city of Grand Rapids website um, forward slash summit and it will get you directly there. And the, and the summit also has a Facebook page. We do have a Facebook page that is active right now. We are highlighting members of the team that are, uh, make up the community. So we are definitely making sure that information is present and open to the, everyone. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you for that's a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> so it's, and it's wonderful information. So thank you for that. And maybe we get in the next segment, we can just talk briefly about the Neighborhood Match Fund. Cool. So, yes. All right. Thank all right. You. So with that, we'll take a little break and we'll be right back.
88.1 FM WYCE, a proud member of the Grand Rapids Community Media Center, has been serving the Grand Rapids community and beyond for over 30 years, offering a world of music through commercial-free, independent radio. Head on over to WYCE.org today, where you can stream our broadcast 24-7, check out exclusive artist interviews, or make a donation. From everyone at 88.1 FM WYCE, thank you for your support. The Wealthy Theatre is Grand Rapids' local movie theatre and performance centre. Since 1998, it has been a host to nationally touring music groups, local theatre performances, and a variety of community events. Today, the Wealthy Theatre is not only a landmark community treasure with historic significance, but a pioneer in the infusion of technology and traditional theatre. Underneath the elegance and classic sensibility that defines Wealthy Theater, there is a matrix of new technologies. The theater is completely digital and outfitted with cameras and microphones for concerts, theater and comedy troupes, speakers and lecturers, and so much more. Experience all that Wealthy Theater has to offer. And bring a friend. Be surprised by the Wealthy Theater. Welcome back to City Connection. Great conversation with Jordan Eatman. He's with the neighborhood. He's a neighborhood connector with the Office of Equity and Engagement. Learning a lot about this next neighborhood summit. I uh, had one quick question yeah. for you. No, it's not going to be quick. <laughs> but with the theme of moving uh, beyond diversity, you said that Grand Rapids is geared to be a change agent in this. And I'm wondering about some of those conversations that are going to be in the individual days at each park and how you see that uh, kind of playing out. Yeah. So. Um, I believe Rapids is the change agent. I think we have been very much so at the forefront of taking on challenges and not steering away from the challenge and really coming out with really embracing innovation during this time period. Um, and so um, it kind of falls in alignment with what we've already been doing and setting that temperament. Um, so I'm really appreciative of your leadership for that, um, to be able to create that space truly, because um, it's not common to be frank um, in today's society so I would say that each of our um, days that are going to be actually at the park um, our keynote speaker Tempest will be doing a panel discussion um, based off of her opening remarks that will be on June 1st mm -hmm. um, so it will definitely be a different conversation that will be happening that she's curating at each of the ones but particularly um, for that last hour we actually invited the neighborhood associations to be able to take part and picking some of those topics for their topic to discuss. So um, one of those, we're looking at the city master plan and making sure that everyone is aware of the city master plan, the new one that is in, on de in development. Um, and then the second one was various different topics that they got to pick from. One of those in particular, looking at the cross-generational conversations mm -hmm. of um, a civil unrest. So taking someone from each of the age groups to really have a table conversation to see what is what is what can be learned, what has been repeating, how how do you manage through the stress of that? Because there's wisdom in all ages. So to have that exchange is is great. Another conversation that will be happening is talking about fatigue and particularly black and brown fatigue. What happens around that? How does your body internalize things? Is it trauma induced? Um, all themed around our core values around Summit, which is resident voice and racial equity. Those are the those are the value, the core values of the Grand Rapids Neighborhood Summit. And so, those um, we wanted to make sure that um, the options that were to be selected fit in alignment to um, around this year's theme about moving beyond diversity. Such critical and intense conversations. It yes. sounds fascinating. I know you probably want people to speak freely and not be under the camera, but are any of these conversations going to be maybe recorded for people that can't make it to the parks or maybe there's a capacity limit or something like that? Yes, yeah, so we are um, going to be having a component of the keynote speaker. 
um, mm -hmm. being able to be recorded as well as the actual um, keynote speaker series that's happening at the park. We actually are in, I'm um, gonna be releasing a summit app, which I didn't get to discuss ah. to you about that either, um, that will actually allow people to broadcast that directly on their phone, no matter where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand there are some digital barriers there, so we'll be able to also put that on our website once that's actually downloaded, but we are making a capa uh, capacity so people can have it in their hand. Um, but um, as far as the more, I would say, intimate conversations we want to respect people's story mm -hmm. and their truth and allow people to to be able to speak without being inhibited mm -hmm. in that regards and sometimes those conversations are not so welcoming when there's a camera there in that regards so we want people to be really really be able to sit back and really um indulge into this conversation that they might be a part of during that time period so those particular sections will not be recorded but the ones with the keynote will be nice all right you talked about an app going to be a part is going to be a part of this in a way that people can really keep up with what's going on. And last month, Mayor, we talked about how some of the parks are going to have Wi-Fi access. Mm -hmm. So I see all that playing well together if it's ready by then. But what what will we be doing with the app? What's all involved in that? Yeah, so the app will be a reminder about what um, the location of the different activity that's going on. Um, we also will be having the passport being directly connected to the app meaning typically and we'll still have some that are printed of course but typically um we have a passport that you have to go to so many different resource tables to enter into the raffle well we're trying to do as much contactless as possible due to the conditions <laughs> and so this app will allow each of the actual vendors to have their own QRS code that yeah. you would just take a picture on it would time stamp it and seal it in for that individual and that would mm -hmm. keep that in the background for them to move forward on that so it's really exciting to be able to bring some technology to to summit um, in that regards um, and hopefully gearing up for next year's theme um, hopefully once we pick that I'm trying to push towards innovation <laughs> um, <laughs> around that I and so it. I, the committee has to select on that and, and, and pick that. It's not my decision, um, but I am pushing towards that. Um, but yeah, this is all in alignment to what we're doing and, and the initiatives as, as far as getting that Wi-Fi at the parks. And these park locations will have yeah. Wi-Fi access. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. You know, this, um, it's a, almost a week, but it would have been right about Festival of the Arts time. Mm -hmm. And we know that Festival of the Arts is, is mostly moving to the fall, yeah. for at least uh, the main part of the activities that we're used to. So was this important for your choice of dates? Or do you, did you feel people mm -hmm. were already geared for an outdoor event, or did it just happen that way? Yes, yeah, so I would say um, it kind of fell in perfectly, actually. So we, we planned Summit when Summit ends we have about a three week break and then summit planning for the next year starts again <laughs> so we actually picked that day quite early um to be frank in regards to that okay. uh, we knew that there were some things canceled as a result of the pandemic um, but the beauty part about this, we are actually um, bringing in the Festival of Arts as one of our community partners. So they will actually be passing out kids bag activities to take for their home as they leave Summit to do at home. And so it, it was very intentional, um, very important to have that collaboration aspect of it because it's also one of our city values is yeah. to be collaborative and so that is something to be um, to put out there that that's something that we did want to do to make sure that we are partner as much community partners as possible. Yeah. And the timing is nice because the following week is when our parks, our splash pads will open mm -hmm. and our pools will open. So pools will be open this year, thank goodness. Uh, and, so th and so it is really good timing as students are getting done with school and the summit and then summer activities. My favorite season of the year, <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, you wanted to ask a little bit more about the neighborhood matching funds oh, yeah. that uh, Jordana is involved in. Yeah, and, and uh, the connection between the two is that mm -hmm. uh, our very first Neighborhood Summit, we had a speaker from Seattle who started a Neighborhood Match Fund in Seattle. And um, it was from that first summit that we decided to create a Neighborhood Match Fund in Grand Rapids. And it was funded the following year in the budget, in the, during the budget process. And, and that too has grown mm -hmm. uh, with Stacey Stout's leadership and Jordan's leadership. Uh, and I'd say this last year we made some changes because of the pandemic, but we just went through another round. So do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I would say I would give all credit for the most, um, the most late, the latest transformation to my colleague Suzette Long. She has 
um, been the leader as far as leading that forefront in regards to neighborhood summit. I'm sorry, neighborhood match fund, excuse me. Um, but I will say the neighborhood match fund um, each year has a part of summit. So not only do we highlight um, the, the year's events that were awarded to be a part of Neighborhood Summit, we actually highlight them on stage at, at the Neighborhood Summit to really say, hey, this is some great work that we're doing mm -hmm. in the community. Uh, we want to highlight these individuals and thank them for actually um, applying for the mini grant to transform whatever community they are being a part of to help initiate that. And so the, the Neighborhood Match Fund um, went from a four times a year cycle to a two times a year cycle. Um, and with longer periods to get it done. Uh, so they have six months to complete the project. The next application phase opens up in June. So this is actually perfect okay. timing from mm -hmm. where um, what we are doing now with um, the summit. Um, they get anywhere between, they can apply for anywhere between 500 to 10,000 dollars to put forth any form of an initiative to help bring residents together right it's about that sense of community that sense of belonging whether it's projects for beautification projects or it's murals that you see on now buildings downtown mm -hmm. or some that are in the neighborhoods um, to um, community gatherings or doing shutting down a block because you want to have a block club on your street to really bring neighbors together. It's really about making sure that there's space that if you desire to be the change or you want to see a change in your neighborhood that you have the space to do so and that the city is going to support you in that effort. Um, and so it's a really a great opportunity um, to get that information out and everything. So it's been amazing. Yeah. And um, the match part uh, doesn't have to be financial. In fact, oftentimes it's not. It's not. It's uh, it can be volunteer hours. It can be donated um, products for Correct. some of the some of the um, the the black book boxes yep. uh, that a lot of that was donated uh, wood and painting mm -hmm. and. So it's a, it's a great way to bring people together and then you can use the time that people give or the talent that they give um, to match with the dollars that the city gives. So every volunteer hour is worth $20 an hour. And so mm -hmm. even if it's, hey, I have, all of us will be $30 right, or to where I would say 60 um, for us to be able to do that. But also as she stated, um, if you got a donation of $500, that goes towards whatever you actually got awarded. So whatever your amount was awarded, whether it's $500 or $1,000, if it's $500, you have to also match that $500, which can be yeah. done through volunteer time or donations. So it's a great opportunity for people not to feel like, I have too much pressure yeah. and I got to be locked in if I don't raise this money. In fact, we try to tell you, don't give it back. We want you to spend <laughs> it. Literally, we ask you, like, we've had that often. We're like, they give and try to give it back. We're like, no, how about, have you thought about expanding your program or your project? We want to make sure that people have the opportunity to really make that change that they desire. And the application is easy. Um, it's been streamlined. It can be written or now on video. And Correct. So there's, it's, we've tried to make it a, a, a simple process for folks because we want to, to give money to people in neighborhoods to see their vision or their idea come to life. Um, and we know that it builds social connectivity and community uh, and it has a huge impact on neighborhoods. People, people can do amazing things with a little bit of money and, and a passion and heart for the work that they're doing. Excellent. And, and I would say she also is teaching them how to swim, right? Like you could <laughs> yeah. teach someone like literally yeah. like it's so interesting to see how this application is teaching our residents how to apply for bigger grants yeah. because it's very similar to those other grants that are out there. And so when they master this one or feel less intimidated by this process, we're encouraging them to go after the bigger fish um, for those bigger projects or those bigger dreams that they okay. want to do. So it's a very it's a very full circle type of application and, and program. So we're excited. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Jordan, even your title as Neighborhood Connector seems so appropriate. <laughs> Thanks for all of this information on the Neighborhood Summit coming up at the beginning of next month and the Neighborhood Matching Funds. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be right Thank back you. after this break. Pitying for the community provides an alternative. 
to be the eyes of somebody who's not there. It's more honest, more authentic, and more true. And you do have the freedom to talk about things because they're things that need to be talked about, not because they'll get readers or viewers or clicks. Sometimes it feels intimidating to write a news story or, or to write a story about a, a community issue. What I love about the Rapidian is that they make it really simple and easy. So it's not like you have to meet this deadline by this time. I'll be eating a sandwich in one hand and then I'm like typing in the other. I love the freedom to be able to write from wherever. I think it's a really powerful experience when people are able to tell their story and to be heard. Anyone can have a voice. Anybody can speak. It's a platform for the community to tell its own story in a very authentic way and that's powerful. The community has to be involved in order for it to be sustainable and so it tells you something about our community. Welcome back to City Connection, and uh, again, our thanks to Jordan and a great conversation there. As uh, the three of us were at the table off air, we talked a little bit about how we're three of us that are fully vaccinated, and you wanted to comment a little bit about that importance. Yeah, so I uh, thank you. Uh, that's a great uh, topic to start on in this last section. Uh, it's really important that people, if they have questions about the vaccine, that they reach out to their doctor, to a medical professional, and have mm -hmm. their questions or concerns answered. Um, we know that we need more people to get vaccinated to get to that herd immunity. Uh, and now with the recent announcement from the governor that our openings uh, are directly connected to vaccination rates, if we're gonna um, support our local businesses and our venues uh, and the, the businesses, especially the locally owned businesses that have been struggling this past year, uh, we really need to step up and, and get to that herd immunity. Uh, so I, I, as I said, I was vaccinated at the vaccine clinic, which by the way, the DeVos uh, Convention Center vaccine clinic, the large clinic is actually winding down. So the last day that they'll be giving vaccines is May 21st. Uh, and then they'll, they'll go out and do smaller clinics throughout neighborhoods, throughout the entire county. Um, so they're partnering with a whole host of community partners to get out and get into community and try to reach people who maybe aren't comfortable coming downtown or haven't been able to to go to another site. Um, but I was saying that, uh, you know, after my vaccine, uh, you know, I did feel a huge sense of relief uh, just knowing that I had it. And, and I didn't, I don't know about you, I didn't have any serious side effects. I, I had a little sore arm. Uh, yep. And uh, besides that, I was just fine. I know that's not the case for everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I've talked to some people who've had side effects and they've said um, the side effects from the vaccine uh, were far less than uh, the symptoms that um, people they knew and loved had when they actually had COVID. So yeah, very important as we move towards those um, higher percents of the population that are vaccinated. Yeah. Right. Well, let's do a total shifting of gears. All um, right. You and uh, City Manager Mark Washington are holding a virtual town hall meeting later this week. I think it's yeah. Thursday. And it's on the topic of the budget, which yeah. probably was a bit challenging this year. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us a, a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. So we are hosting a budget town hall. We've done this uh, at, in the past, actually, um, twice in the past. So we're still learning uh, as we go and how to have these virtual town halls. Uh, but we will be having a budget town hall hall on Thursday at six o'clock um, it will be on our Facebook page and YouTube and you can you can uh, join us there um, the, so at last Tuesday the city manager presented the budget recommendation to the City Commission so with a city manager form of government that's the process the city manager works on the budget with department heads and his um, internal team and our CFO it's presented to the full city commission. We spend several weeks um, going through the budget, um, through budget deliberation processes, mm -hmm. and then we have a public hearing um, before we uh, cast a vote or make any changes to the budget. Uh, so the budget was presented last week. It's a, a, a little over $540 million budget. Uh, about 155 million of that is the general fund. So this is what I always try to explain to people is that there are two primary funds, um, one of them, 
uh, we don't have a, a whole lot of influence on uh, because it's uh, enterprise funds are are there's clear parameters as I should say under mm -hmm. state law uh, and those are the funds like water and sewer and parking it's where the fees that we get actually pay for the service um, so those are called enterprise mm -hmm. funds and some of our largest uh, uh, departments fall under the enterprise fund and then the general operating fund is where you have other departments like police department fire department parks department economic development planning so that falls under the general operating fund so the, those departments and and those budgets are the ones that we take a deep dive into um, because of the federal uh, recovery act um, funds which we haven't received yet in fact the final guidelines haven't been uh, haven't been confirmed yet <laughs> we're still waiting on um, Treasury um, but as of right now we are estimating that the city of Grand Rapids will receive roughly 90 million dollars uh, because of those funds we are able to fill a pretty significant budget deficit that we currently have in the current fiscal year and that we're projecting into next year so with this budget that the city manager presented uh, it's largely a continuation budget so there aren't significant changes to the budget that we're currently um, reviewing uh, based on last year. There are some things that we're going to continue with um, with recovery dollars. So for instance, the hot team being one of those um, that was added on after the pandemic last year and we'll continue that with um, ARPA funds. Uh, but overall, it's largely a continuation budget. Um, and then there's some uh, allocation like support for the hot team, support for cure violence that is in this budget. Once we know uh, how much money we'll get from the feds, and once we pass this budget, which is our budget for the entire city that we have to do um, by July 1, and it has to be a balanced budget, that's actually state law. Um, unlike the feds, we can't run a deficit then any unallocated dollars that we get from the feds we will have a separate process uh, likely end of june through august to determine how those funds will be spent um, we're already starting to talk about uh, a few things uh, like putting a certain amount of money into the affordable housing fund so that's a huge priority i'd like to see 10 million i don't think we're going to have that much um, maybe it will this year we'll be able to put five million in and then also um, funds to invest in third ward equity fund as well as our neighborhoods of focus mm -hmm. so those neighborhoods where we know that we have significant disparities um, and neighborhoods that have been disinvested in for a long time but those decisions won't uh, we won't have that conversation until this summer so we're kind of mm -hmm. having two processes our typical budget process let's pass our fiscal our fiscal plan and then unallocated funds we'll have another conversation about Okay, and now you had mentioned some funding for Cure Violence mm -hmm. uh, yeah. program, and that is uh, a little bit of the response to, um, well, the realization that there's a lot of summer violence more yeah. than even in the colder weather. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah so this um, it, <laughs> Cure Violence and implementing an evidence-based violence prevention program has actually been talked about for a long time. In fact, I went back uh, it, several months ago when I did my State of the City, I went back and read my earlier State of the City addresses and I had mentioned an evidence-based violence prevention program multiple times since I've been mayor. And, uh, you know, there, there was a number of reasons why we didn't move forward, uh, I would say a couple of years ago, and, and probably a little bit of uh, difference of opinion on what program to move forward with and what that should look like, but the commission finally coalesced around a plan, uh, and what we decided to do is move forward with Cure Violence, so the national organization, um, contract directly with them, and then work with them to identify a community partner. So at our last city commission meeting, we uh, approved $100,000 to move forward with Cure Violence. Uh, and then we have a number of community partners who have joined us in that effort, including Spectrum Health. So Spectrum uh, is, uh, is contributing $100,000 a year for the next three years uh, towards this evidence-based violence prevention program. So next steps will then be to work with Cure Violence to identify a community partner who will be the ones that actually hire the individuals who are doing the, um, you know, the violence disruptors. So people in community mm -hmm. who have relationships who will work with Cure Violence. Uh, and then there will be a, a data component where we will actually mm -hmm. collect data. Um, so you're right, it, it comes on the tail of one of our, um, our most deadly violent years. Uh, and so to me, it's more urgent now than ever so that we don't have 
the same type of violence and tragedy that we saw last summer. There was an effort to find community members or community organizations to work on the issue of gun violence in particular. Is this yeah. kind of the continuation of that effort? Yeah. So we have, um, so we have, we have a, a number of efforts still, still mm -hmm. focused on um, reducing gun violence. Uh, we did put out last last year in December. We did put out an RFP to see if we could identify a local nonprofit that would help in this work, and we went through the process and re re we received some uh, proposals. Uh, we had a team that reviewed those proposals, and they determined they didn't really meet what we were hoping to accomplish. And that's when the decision was to um, move forward with Cure Violence, get that relationship established, have them lead the effort, and this will fall under our. Um, Office of Public Oversight and Accountability. So Mr. Brandon Davis, mm -hmm. he's overseeing this process. And I think that there was a little debate about that in the past as well. Um, where would this program kind of live as people kept asking and some people wanted it in a uh, neighborhood or a, a community organization. Some people wanted it in the police department. Some people wanted it at the health department, the county health department. Um, but we know the health department doesn't have the capacity right now with their mm -hmm. laser-like yeah. focus on the vaccine and the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so as we've gotten the OPA office off the ground, it made a lot of sense for it to fall under under um, the Office of Public Oversight and Accountability. So that's where that program will live. And you mentioned the desire to have it be evidence-based. Is that that yes. data component that you said is embedded in the cure violence aspect? Yes. So we will be we will be um, working with cure violence to have a data component and to be evaluating the effectiveness of the program. And my hope is that after um, two years, we'll have good data, uh, and then we'll be able to look at okay can we make this a permanent program in our community? So initially, what we're moving forward with is a three-year pilot, um, but my hope is that we are able to then continue it far beyond that, far after, you know, long after I'm gone. I'm, I'm only <laughs> mayor for three more years, and, <laughs> and uh, hopefully this will be one of the programs that the next mayor will be able to continue. Okay. Well, with the last minute or so, I wondered if you would wrap up with just some of the summer events that we can look forward to now yeah. that uh, we're looking forward to some higher levels of vaccination. What's possible yeah. this summer? It's usually busy. Yes. I, I'm hopeful that we have a whole host of um, events. I think you'll start to see them uh, kick into high gear probably more like in July. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are starting to see. You can, we actually have an event page on our city's website. Um, so you can go and see what's happening. But we kicked off on Friday the first ever Grand Rapids Fitness Fest, uh, which is 10 days of over 100 opportunities for people to go outside and work out outside. So we're mm -hmm. calling it Get Fit uh, Grand Rapids, knowing that a lot of people put on a few extra pounds during COVID. But also it's just a great way to connect with community. So on Friday night, I was at the Calder, and I did, an, I did a class, an exercise class, and there were well over 300 people there. Oh my gosh, yeah, wow. It was broken up into two classes, one at 4.30 and one at 6. Uh, but it was a huge turnout, and we'll continue to, so we'll have fitness classes, um, not just for Fitness Fest, but throughout the summer at different public spaces. You're starting to see concert series um, get teed up. So we have bands at Blanford just announced that they'll start back up at their uh, band night and concert series. And uh, Ralston announced and, and Local Spins that they'll be doing Tuesday nights mm -hmm. at Frederick Mar Gardens. So I think you'll start to see, I know Studio Park is starting to have outside concerts. Uh, and so hopefully there will be a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. for safe outside gatherings. Looking forward to that. Well, yeah. we'll wrap up for this month. Next month, you and I will be back. It's uh, set for June 7th, if all yeah. schedules work. And uh, we'll close out for City Connection with Mayor Rosalind Bliss. I'm Linda Glass here on JRTV's Livewire Channel 24.